From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, we are off to the races after inflation came in lighter than expected. We should hit all new highs today on the S&P and the NASDAQ. The countdown to the open starts right now. Good morning, I'm Matt Miller. Coming up, another downside surprise for U.S. inflation, sending futures higher and yields plummeting as investors count down to Chairman Powell. We begin with the big issue, signs of slower inflation. This was uh, good news for the committee. They've been looking for a softer report. They got it here, but the typical reaction would be, okay, this is good, but this is one month's numbers. We would need more news going in this direction in order to, uh, in order to forge ahead with our easing policy. But it does keep hope alive for, uh, for those that have been looking for an earlier uh, rate cut. Joining us now to discuss is Lori Calvacina, RBC Capital Markets Head of U.S. Equity Strategy. And Lori, I was pumped uh, for the CPI number today. I think it's less exciting, a little bit less exciting, but good, obviously, for America if it comes down. Does this mean that the Fed can start to give us a clearer picture of the rate path forward? Well, thanks for having me on, as always, Matt. Look, I think we're going to have to see what they say. Um, I, I do think this was a good print this morning, but one of the things that my rate strategist really emphasized to me coming in today was that one good print was not necessarily going to be enough to change our house call, uh, which is for a cut in December. And they thought that the Fed was really going to need to see a number of good prints, just the way we saw a number of bad prints to start the year, that we were going to need to see a number of good prints before we really want to start getting excited again. So your house call is for only one cut and not until the very end of the year, right? Do you expect the dot plot to show also um, only one cut today from the Fed? You know, I'm not in the business of forecasting the dot plot. I'm going to leave that to the experts there. Um, but what I will be looking for generally as an equity person is the direction of travel of forecasts on the south side generally. And if I look back to that last Fed meeting, I think one thing that really concerned me was that after we got out of the press conference, we really saw people latch onto a very dovish narrative and take it too far in one direction. And then we had to dial that back down and that generated some volatility in equity markets. Um, so, you know, I look at this as an equity person this morning as a good print. I'm excited to see it. Um, but I'm also a little bit worried. I think I think Bullard called it Mr. Toad's wild ride in the last show. Um, I'm a little bit worried about getting back in line for that again, to be honest. All right, Lori, uh, we do see futures um, jumping higher. We see yields coming down. And I'm excited to talk to you about your view on equities um, with these new market moves. Right now, though, I want to get more on the CPI print. For that, we go to Mike McKee. He's our chief economics and policy correspondent standing by in Washington, D.C. Mike? Uh, Matt, I'm trying to do something with Mr. Toad's wild ride, but I can't really think of a way <laughs> to weave it into this other than the fact that maybe Mr. Toad's jumped into the water and is going down because that's what happened to inflation. Almost every category comes in lower than anticipated. The uh, headline number comes in flat. The core comes in up just two-tenths of a percent of the month, which pushes the year-over-year -year numbers down, particularly for core, by two-tenths to uh, three point uh, 4%. Supercore is the only thing that went up, but that was base effects. On a month-over-month -month basis, Supercore was down. So there's still good news to come there. In terms of what moved, well, it's uh, been a lot of things that we have been expecting to happen, uh, but have not happened up until this point. Gasoline, we knew would be down. 3.6% was a fairly high number. But look at motor vehicle insurance. It had been up 22% over the past year. It comes in down this past month. First time since 2021. New vehicle prices down half a percent. Owner's equivalent rent is up four tenths, but it's a low four tenths when you round it out to three digits. And that suggests, according to some analysts already who are publishing, that we will see because of base effects, rent finally starting to go down, housing finally starting to go down in the next few months. Now, something Laurie said about seeing more 
of uh, this before the Fed makes any decisions. That's exactly what Chris Waller said, uh, the Fed governor, last month. He said, uh, in the absence of a significant weakening in the labor market, I need to see several more months of good inflation data before I would be comfortable supporting an easing in the stance of monetary policy. I think we can count this one as one month. So two more months, June, July, that would put perhaps September into play. And so uh, we move on to the next item on our list, which is the dot plot. What's it going to say? Two or one or what? And then uh, it's our birding hour. <laughs> Does Jay Powell change the direction of the markets, create that volatility Laurie was talking about? Will he be dovish or hawkish, contradict anything? It's going to be a very interesting news conference to listen to. Mike, uh, it's interesting that you say September is in play. I've got a viewer writing in with a question for you. He says, ask Mike, how much does the election around the corner play into the rate cut situation? It's not going to play into it. The Fed is going to do what it wants to do, what it feels it needs to do, when it needs to do it. There would be a lot of people who think that the Fed is going to be influenced by the election, but history shows that they aren't. Uh, And also, September 18th is not uh, that close to the election comparatively. So if they wanted to do one, wait a meeting, and then do another, September, wait November, go December, would be uh, good timing for them. But this is all going to depend on what the inflation data do between now and then. All right, Mike, thanks very much. Michael McKee is our chief economics and policy correspondent coming to us on CPI from Washington, D.C. Now, The number comes in lighter than expected, and Matt Maley over at Miller Tayback um, says after the print, between Apple's upside breakout yesterday and this morning's CPI number, the only thing standing in the way of a further strong rally is Chairman Powell. That's what Mike was saying in terms of the bird watching today. Let's get back to Lori Calvacina. She is the head of U.S. equity strategy for RBC Capital Markets. Lori, do you agree that um, we have much more room to run in this rally due to the lighter print, um, Apple's uh, AI strategy, and hopefully, I guess, uh, a more dovish Jay Powell? So it's it's a great question, Matt. You know, unfortunately, I'm going to tell you that I still feel pretty neutral on the equity market in here. Of course, there's always the possibility for further upside. Um, the tools that we use as a strategist, they tend to be compasses, not GPS. Um, and I certainly don't feel like I'm part of the bearish camp. But when I go through my modeling in terms of looking at inflation rates, in terms of looking at what the Fed might do, in terms of looking at where 10-year yields might end up at the end of the year and what that all implies for PEs in the market and ultimate levels, the best number I continue to come up with is about 5,300. And we're obviously a bit above that right now. But I'll tell you that that scenario in my valuation model comes in with the idea of one or two Fed cuts, 10-year yields that move down to 4.19, and get and PCE that gets back to 2.6%. That's been the sort of published consensus on the self side economics community. That's what we layer into our model. And that's already telling us that about where we are today, even a little bit below, is about fair value. Um, so never say never, um, but in here, I do think a lot of this has already been priced into equities. Lori, I'm going to show you a a Bloomberg function here. It's the um, RRG relative rotation graph on the S&P. And you already know what it says because you've been talking about this in your notes. We see leadership from IT and communication services. So really the MAG-7 leads no matter what range you put. I tried it with one month, three months, six months, 12 months. It's always um, the Magnificent Seven in the leadership position. Will we see a shift back to uh, maybe value? Will we see a shift back to any of the other S&P industry groups as, you know, the 10-year yield starts to come back down? We've seen it come off its April highs and it continues to fall today. It's a great question, Matt. And, you know, one little quirky chart that we've come up with looks at the post-SVB environment. And if you look at 10-year Treasury yields and just whether or not they're going up or down and you compare it to, say, the performance of the top five names in the equity market against the rest of the S&P, just equal weighted baskets, what we've generally found, and this is a very short time horizon, but we've generally found that when yields are rising and there's more nervousness in the market, that that's when we tend to see those top names really cling to their outperformance. And when we get those downdrafts in the 10-year Treasury yield, 
that's when the rotation trade tends to make it, itself known and tends to try to flare up again. So if we did get a break in yield, I think that argues well for a value rotation. But I think the other thing that we really need to see for rotation out of those safer type names is a reinvigoration of economic expectations. And if you look at real GDP forecasts for this year, they've kind of stagnated around 2.4 percent, which is just below average. To really get rotation in the market, you need to see that number pop up above average, kind of get a little bit closer to 3 percent, well over two and a half. We just haven't made any movement there recently. So I think you've really got to have both of those things happen for that rotation trade to get going again. We did see mortgage applications jump this morning at 7 a.m., um, up 15 percent. And it's a, a big move above what we've seen all, all through the last year as rates come down a little bit. Uh, I also note that um, Amanda Agati from PNC, she's the uh, chief investment strategist there, was saying, look, for the 493, right, for the other stocks in the S&P 500, we've been in a six-month earnings recession. Um, you talk about the economy moving. Are we going to see the, the, the 493 start to boost earnings? Um, is that housing picture going to start to boost things as mortgage rates come down? Uh, all great points, Matt. And I'll tell you, for most of this last reporting season, when we looked at the rate of upward revisions in the market, of we looked at this time for the top 10 stocks versus the rest of the S&P 500. For most of this 1Q reporting season, we were getting more upward revisions to analyst forecasts on those other 490 stocks. You were getting fewer on the top 10. Then we slammed into retail reporting season. In these last few weeks, we've actually seen the reverse happen. And so the top 10 names have been where all the earnings excitement has been, again, on a relative basis. So we can see the early signs of healing on the earnings front starting to happen in the broader market. But it did hit a pretty big pothole with those retail reporters. The other thing we talk about a lot, Matt, is that if you just look at forward growth estimates, and Bloomberg has fantastic data that comes up every Friday on this, um, but really you can see that there's a deceleration in the MAG7 earnings growth embedded in current consensus forecasts and a reacceleration in the rest of the market. And guess what? In 2025, those two lines are getting pretty close to converging. So I do think it's not just a question of, you know, kind of a recovery in the broader market. It's a recovery that can rival the growth rates of those MAG7 names. So far, that's proved elusive, but it might be getting closer within the next year or two. Laura, you talk about um, retail, which is something we've been watching very closely. Uh, we're concerned about the consumer maybe loaded up with debt and uh, discriminating more when it comes to purchases. I have famed uh, bearish economist David Rosenberg coming on in a few minutes, and he says we've seen a visible diminishment in corporate pricing power. Do you see that as well? So it's, it's a great point, Matt. You know, I have noticed when we read through earnings call transcripts, if I go back to uh, the calendar first quarter when we were getting the 4Q prints, the company commentary about inflation was just really, really hot. And it's not so much that the pricing commentary was really hot, but we did see corporates really being pressured by those inflationary prints. And we, we, we saw, you know, a decent amount of evidence of some companies trying to cling to that pricing power. As I got to this last reporting season, I will say that the, impl the complaints about input cost pressures really seemed like they died down a bit. They weren't completely gone, um, but they weren't just as hot as they had been in the prior one. And we have noticed, you know, just in recent quarters, if we go back, you know, what we've seen the last few quarters versus what we've seen the last few years, the pricing commentary just isn't as strong as it's been in the past. So I think that's probably a pretty fair comment just based on what I've seen bottom up. Lori, great to get your take uh, this morning. So happy we could have you on. Lori Calvacina there is the head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Joining us now with a look at some of the individual stocks moving ahead of the opening bell today. And we do have a rising tide, so I'm going to guess that most boats are floating. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? You're absolutely right about that, Matt, with the futures up about nine-tenths of one percent for the S&P 500, up for a third day in a row, the best three days since the middle of May. Yes, we do have stocks higher, one of them being Oracle. Now, they, of course, did report earnings a little bit mixed there, but the stock is surging because they also did sign uh, infrastructure, cloud infrastructure deals with both uh, Google Cloud and Microsoft and and open eye. So they're saying that that cloud infrastructure service uh, revenue that yesterday came in at 42% growth below 50% over the last two quarters. Well, it's going to go back above 50%. So investors are really liking that. Now, relative to uh, banks, we have a nice rally there with CPI coming off. JP Morgan, uh, along with Citigroup, are higher. Key, the regional banks really getting a, a big move up. And that Russell 2000 on the bottom of the board here, Matt, we have IWM, something we typically would 
wouldn't take a look at, but given the rally off of the basically inline CPI print, uh, we have small caps off to the races right now heading to the best day of the year. All right, Abigail, thanks very much. Abigail Doolittle looking at stocks on a day when we are ready for a rally. Coming up, CPI data fueling Fed cut wagers. I literally breathed a sigh of relief for a lot of reasons I suspect Chair Powell did too, uh, for consumers who are not gonna see as much month over month increase in prices. We'll discuss with one of the market's most famous bears, David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research joins us next and he sees there's real difficulty for corporate pricing power. We'll talk about that with him next. This is Bloomberg. literally breathed a sigh of relief for a lot of reasons I suspect Chair Powell did too, uh, for consumers who are not going to see as much month over month increase in prices. For all the economists out there with a September rate cut in their forecast, they're probably also relieved. But also bigger picture, uh, higher rates are working to bring down inflation. This was an increasing concern. Uh, are, are rates restrictive enough? Do we keep them this high? Why is inflation not moving downward? All right, for more reaction to this morning's CPI data and much more in the market, we are joined by David Rosenberg, Rosenberg Research founder and president. I still remember, David, when uh, Business Week named you one of the four horsemen of the great financial crisis, which I guess uh, was a good thing you called it. Um, what do you think about the current inflation picture? Because we're all very excited for the CPI number. I know it's only one print today, but it, it came in a little bit light and does it show that maybe the Fed's on the right path? Well, I think that that's the case. And I think that what today's uh, report did uh, was underscore uh, how a few of these components in the CPI and, and primarily auto insurance, uh, which actually went down 0.1% uh, uh, in May, uh, you know, the, the deviation between what happened in the opening months of this year compared to the disinflation momentum last year came down to a couple of areas. Auto insurance was the poster child. Uh, there was also financial services. Well, that deflated in the report today as well, and healthcare insurance, and that moderated. So it was narrowly confined. Uh, I, I thought the numbers today, and I wrote about it, were going to come in uh, for a change uh, below consensus. Uh, I'm pleased that they did. But you know, we got to remember that the CPI is truly a flawed statistic where a third of the index uh, is uh, the rental metrics. And all we have to do is just look at the Fed beige book, uh, which actually reflects what business contacts are saying industry by industry across the entire country. Uh, and the beige book that came out for May uh, showed what I written about and that you mentioned, which was, was this diminishment of pricing power. And what's happening is that consumers finally, now that the savings cushion is gone, uh, consumers are now realizing just how punishingly high the price level is. And so now you're seeing businesses being forced to respond and that's gonna come out of margins. So we do see the savings rate completely gone and um, Consumers have become uh, more discriminating. On the other hand, we saw mortgage applications this morning, David, shoot up like 15% and change. And, you know, they had been dropping, I think, 5.5% last month. Obviously, you know, with rates this high, it's more expensive to get a mortgage. Builders aren't excited to start new projects. But is that slowly changing as we see, um, you know, rates come off their April highs? Well, you know, uh, that's a bit of a, what I would say is a contra cyclical indicator. You'd have to ask yourself the question, uh, if households are so flush uh, with wage income and cash flow, why would they now be resorting uh, to cash out refinancings? Um, so it's actually a measure at the margin of accelerating consumer financial stress beneath the surface. If that, I mean, so that isn't a great look then for the consumer. Um, savings rate also bad. What about the 
labor picture. I mean, that's the key, right? And I was talking to my buddy Joe Brusuelas um, this morning, and he said, ask David about, you know, this flawed statistic, because we saw in the last report a non-farm payroll jump of like 275, and but the household survey showed a drop of 400. So what does the labor picture look like? Well, the decidedly mixed. Um, I mean, the, the odd man out uh, on the labor market side was non-farm payrolls, but you see the Fed has trained everybody to believe that uh, it's the holy grail of the labor market statistics. And historically, the non-farm was the gold standard. But here's the problem is that since COVID, uh, the, re the, the response rate to the initial report is barely more than 40%. Uh, before COVID, it was over 60%. And that's why you're seeing this really historical development taking place in the data which is what non-farm payrolls look like three months later. And uh, it's remarkable that the revisions have been squarely to the downside and are more than double, almost triple what they've been historically in terms of the last estimate you get on payrolls uh, and the first estimate. So of course, everybody trades off the first estimate, then they forget a few months later that actually the number was a lot lower uh, than what was expected. And so that's very interesting because um, the response rate being so low has made the non-farm payroll survey, uh, let's just say, less veracity in the initial report than it had in the past. And let's also keep in mind that in the past year, half of the growth in the establishment survey wasn't even from the survey, it was from the birth death model. So I would say that, um, you know, the household survey right now, when you trend it out, household survey employment growth year over year is running at the grand total of 0.2 percent and all of that 0.2 percent is in part-time jobs full-time jobs are down almost one percent year over year which in the past seven yep. decades has only happened when the economy was in recession no and the non-farm payrolls are showing 1.8 percent growth it is a very wide divide and it's just showing a lot more confusion into the picture but my money is on the household survey not the payroll survey all right, David, I'm going to get your take on the dots, uh, what the Fed does going forward. I also want to get your take on the MAG-7, um, the earnings recession that the other 493 are in and, and the markets. Uh, we're going to get David Rosenberg back in just a few minutes from Rosenberg Research. Coming up, the morning calls and Constance Hunter is going to join us as well of Macro Policy Perspectives. She says not all paths to a rate cut are priced in in these markets. She's going to join us uh, later this hour. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the morning calls. First up, Goldman Sachs downgrading Birkenstocks to a neutral. The firm notes the strong brand momentum, but recent strong performance leaves the shares fairly valued, they say at Goldman. Next up, Wells Fargo is cutting Paramount to an underweight, saying Sherry Redstone's decision to walk away from merger talks with Skydance will add to the long shadow over the company. And finally, Mizuho downgrading Next Era Energy, Bill Gross's pick, to a neutral. They see limited incremental catalysts for the stock to go higher. This is the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller. Moments away from the start of trading, we are looking at futures higher across the board, and this will drive us once again to an all-time record high on the S&P. I believe it'll be the 27th record high when the cash trade kicks off. There you hear the opening bell, and we see some real glam here on the New York Stock Exchange floor as Estee Lauder rings the bell. Um, very interesting group there uh, up on the balcony. Let's take a look at some of the other assets that are moving today. The euro had been down in a, with a 107 handle last couple days. It's popped back up now to 108 um, and change where it has been for the last month. 
otherwise. The U.S. 10-year coming down now 428. And as we see yields moving off of their April highs, we got a big pop in mortgage applications today. I thought that was very interesting. NYMEX crude uh, approaching $80 a barrel again right now up $1.33. To 79.23. One of the stocks that we're watching closely at the open today is Oracle. That company reporting better than expected bookings and announcing partnerships with rivals Microsoft and OpenAI. Abigail Doolittle has more on, uh, I guess, the AI partnerships that we've seen the last couple of days, Abby. Yeah, that's really the big piece of this story because they actually missed earnings. And in the after hours yesterday, we had this stock briefly all over the map. So those partnerships with Google AI and Microsoft and OpenAI came out before the earnings, the stock popped after having been down on the day. Then the earnings miss came out. It was down a little bit. And then investors really are focusing on uh, that cloud potential because, in fact, uh, the company is saying that their cloud infrastructure, that key business part, uh, that the growth will return to above 50 percent on an annual or on a quarterly basis on a year over year look. And that's where it had been in this most recent quarter. Importantly, it was a little bit better than expected, 42 percent growth, but down from before. Now, analysts on this name are uh, encouraged but still staying somewhat neutral. Uh, Mark Murphy over JP Morgan, somewhat of an ax on any company he falls, uh, follows, staying neutral. Interestingly, on the Cerner, that is expected, that healthcare acquisition that they made back in 2022, expected to drag on the year by 2%. But the update that we got, that they will no longer be breaking that out, considering that it's now a part of the operating structure and returning to growth. So overall, investors really liking these results. The stock up 9.3%, heading, Matt, to its best day since the middle of March. Got it. Abby, thanks very much. Abigail, do a little looking there at Oracle. Let's turn now to the autos industry. Stellantis rising after the EU announcing it'll impose additional tariffs of as much as 38 percent on EVs shipped in from China. A little protectionism. Uh, never heard of stock. Bloomberg Global Autos editor Craig Trudell is here with more. Craig? Yeah, it's maybe hurting some uh, Chinese uh, stocks, but absolutely is is uh, a positive for Stellantis, in part because this is a company that really, uh, you know, its bread is, is buttered by the mass market market segments in Europe. They uh, really, it, that is also where the concern lies in terms of, you know, Chinese EVs coming into Europe and uh, potentially having the ability to undercut manufacturers like a Stellantis, like Volkswagen on price. And you know, you do have uh, some concerns if you're a Volkswagen or some of the Ger German manufacturers of retaliation, of course. And, and we have a situation in Stellantis where, you know, this is a company that doesn't have a significant presence in China and is able to, to sort of avoid some of the crossfire that maybe some of its compatriots in, in Germany uh, you know, are, are now worried about as a result of the move today by the European Commission. Yeah, I remember when they pulled out some of their uh, last remaining Jeep factories out of China, but it's a very good point, Craig. We should remember that there are a lot of Western automakers that count on China for a huge uh, piece of their revenue, so it does cut both ways. Craig Trudell there, our auto czar out of London. Let's turn now to the meme stocks picture this morning. GameStop raising about $2.14 billion from a share sale program capitalizing on a rally fueled by Keith Gill, also known as Roaring Kitty. Typically, when a company sells shares, that um, is a problem for the current shareholders as it dilutes uh, their holdings. But with this stock, it, it hasn't hurt in the past. Today, it's down 5%. Alex Semenova joins us with more. Alex? Good morning, Matt. Well, GameStop has been struggling with a failed e-commerce strategy. It's been seeing its stores close, but one thing that it has going for it is its cash holdings. That's thanks, of course, to Keith Gill, a.k.a. Roaring Kitty, returning to YouTube and rallying up retail investors. Uh, GME raised $2 billion on the sale of 75 million shares. Uh, in total, it has raised $3 billion in the past month on these share sales as, of course, uh, the retail frenzy comes back. Uh, the stock stock is down right now about 6%. As you mentioned, it's been seeing some wild swings back and forth. I want to note as well that this morning, Andrew Left of Citron Research said that he is no longer short the company. He, of course, has been badly burned on his short position in GameStop, both in 2021 and again on this meme stock mania return. Uh, he said, though, that uh, leaving his short is not because he believes in a turnaround for the company, but because he respects the market's irrationality. He respects the irrationality. I like that. Alex, thanks very much. Alex Simon over there, 
on GameStop. We are back now with David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research. And David, you know, a lot of people diss the dot plot. Um, I get it. It's simple, maybe too uh, much so, but I still like to look at it. And of course, we're waiting to see where the dots are today. I note that I recently learned um, Powell uh, tells the other Fed members that they can change their dots as as late as you know this morning past the CPI numbers. What are you expecting on the dot plot for this year? Well, I, I think that uh, they'll probably go to uh, two cuts. I know there's some people that think that uh, the median will show one or maybe even none. Uh, you know, look, the Fed historically is a, a very deliberate, slow-moving institution. So I don't think they're going from three at the margin to one. Uh, I think they'll show two cuts uh, between now and the end of the year today. So and that'll, you know, set off the equity markets again. We've been on um, this incredible rally, all fueled by those big seven mega cap tech stocks. Does that continue uh, in your mind? Do we continue to see um, this rally as Andrew left? Maybe fittingly says he respects the irrationality of the market. Mm. Well, look, this is a uh, nobody wants to call it that because it's so insulting. Um, but it is a bubble, and I guess if you believe that this bubble will get as big as uh, what well, we saw, you know, in '99 and early 2000, then then sure, you know, the the sky's the limit. Um, but you know, we backed out what the five-year EPS growth estimate is embedded in the S&P 500, uh, and uh, it's 17 percent per annum. That is the five-year embedded EPS growth expectation, and it took on a huge inflection point when, in May of 2023, after that initial blowout NVIDIA report. And so it's all about uh, generative AI and uh, how that's revolutionary. Uh, I think it's maybe more evolutionary, but uh, the market is speaking. Uh, historically, the five-year EPS growth in the S&P averages out to be around 6%. Uh, we're at 17% right now. So, you know, there's a there's a lot priced in. And of course, as you said, you're seeing it in the relative performance of the MAG-7. Uh, you know, their earnings are up 100% over the past year. The rest of the market, the 493 stocks, uh, their collective earnings are negative 3%. Uh, so, you know, as you said before, there's uh, bifurcation in the employment data and there's huge bifurcation in the stock market. But, uh, you know, who can call what the top is going to be on these uh, mega cap tech stocks. It's well, probably going to take ultimately uh, some disappointing guidance, uh, which ultimately is what brought Cisco down to its knees uh, heading into 2001, if you remember. But that, that's really what it's going to take. I do remember, and there have been some comparisons uh, between now and then. But, David, without exception, every single strategist I've spoken with over the last month has said uh, that she or he sees a broadening out in this market. And to be fair, I haven't spoken to a lot of bears because there really aren't any left, right? Um, mm. Do you see that breadth coming back to this market? Where do you look to measure that? Um, is there a rotation coming back? What, what, are the, what are the data points that you're focused on? Well, the problem that I have with the broadening out view is what's the catalyst going to be? Um, because so much of the other part of the market that's lagged behind uh, is value or cyclical. Uh, and the economy is slowing down. Um, this is uh, people are still looking at the economy in the rearview mirror. They still think it's strong. Uh, I hear all sorts of uh, former Fed officials uh, on your show and other shows talking about the strong economy. No, that is in the rearview mirror. That was last year's story. We've taken a three percent growth economy, and now we're basically call it somewhere between one and two percent. And what's happening is that you're having aggregate demand growth in the United States falling below the trend in aggregate supply. What does that do? Well, it does what we talked about earlier, Matt. It, 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 uh, it ultimately triggers a diminishment in pricing power and top line growth. So I don't see what the catalyst is going to be. Uh, for the other parts of the market. What, you know, uh, I've, David, I, Atlanta Fed yeah. now has 3.6% for GDP growth next quarter. Yesterday, we got headlines from the World Bank raising their estimate of uh, not only U.S. growth, but also global growth. Do you not see that view um, picking up? Uh, 
No, I would say that I'm on the other side of that trade. And, uh, you know, you could mention the Atlanta Fed, um, but the St. Louis Fed now cast last I saw was 1.2. Um, so yet more confusion, uh, more bifurcation, Atlanta Fed over here, St. Louis Fed over there. Remember the St. Louis, the, the Atlanta Fed was close to 4% just a couple of months uh, before we got the release of first quarter GDP, which came in at 1.3. Um, so, no, I am seeing decisive signs that the economy is cooling off and it doesn't have to be a recession call. What's yeah. happening here is that the growth in aggregate demand is slowing below the pace of aggregate supply. That is why these inflation numbers are going to continue to melt. Got it. And that was exactly the tone in the beige book, which is the real world. It's not a world of massaged consumer price data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That is what yep. business contacts are telling you. So tell me, why is that going to change? I mean, we saw that in practically every beige book so far this year with an exclamation mark for the May beige book telling you that corporate pricing power uh, is receding. What's going to cause that to change over the course, say, of the next several months? And that comes out of top line growth. I'll tell you what. So, no, I'm not exactly optimistic about um, the value proposition of the cyclical stocks, which I would admit that we will need that as an offset, you know, once these high flyers, um, you know, start to catch down to reality. I, um, but I, I see that as a low odds bet. I, I get that. And I'm going to put that question uh, to my next guest, David. So I really appreciate your time. David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research and maybe one of the very lonely bears out there um, on the economy. We did get a revision in GDP for the first quarter down from one six to one three. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, we've been getting revisions up from like the World Bank. Coming up, uh, we're going to count down to Chair Powell. Obviously, the big Fed decision coming out at two o'clock. One good print was not necessarily going to be enough to change our house call, uh, which is for a cut in December. And they thought that the Fed was really going to need to see a number of good prints. We look ahead to today's Fed decision next with Constance Hunter of Macro Policy Perspectives. I'll ask her what she thinks about aggregate demand coming down below aggregate supply. This is Bloomberg. One good print was not necessarily going to be enough to change our house call, uh, which is for a cut in December. And they thought that the Fed was really going to need to see a number of good prints. As an equity person this morning, as a good print, I'm excited to see it. Um, but I'm also a little bit worried. I think Lori Calvacina there talking about the concerns. Apple uh, investors not seeing any. Those shares rising 2.5%, now set to overtake Microsoft in terms of total market value. Obviously, it's in that $3 trillion uh, club, $3.26 trillion uh, right now. Only uh, others are Microsoft and, of course, NVIDIA. Um, let's talk with Constance Hunter right now. She's senior advisor at Macro Policy Perspectives. I'm very excited to be able to get her on the show because she was just uh, over there in radio with Paul Sweeney. Um, she, you're working with Julia Coronado, which is really exciting. You it know, is exciting. I, I haven't seen you in a long time because I've been on paternity leave for the last six months. But wh what a day um, to have you on after we get this print showing that inflation is softening a little bit. Um, and I just talked to David Rosenberg. He said, you know, that's because aggregate demand is falling below aggregate supply. Do you buy that? Uh, David Rosenberg is a perennial bear. And yes, yes it's good to have those people in the market. There aren't right? many left. <laughs> Who else is there? It's hard to find them. I agree. Um, look, we are seeing softening demand. And you see it when you look at the prices for consumer discretionary goods. Those are all coming down. And you saw it in the beige book, consumers sort of pushing back on price increases. You see it with exactly. this price competition from Target and Walmart and Amazon. And that's good, right? That's a really good thing. What we now need to happen, and which will probably happen, is we need to cut rates enough that we get a positive sloping yield curve. Because if that happens, yes, we might experience a soft patch before that happens, but there is so much fundamentally uh, so much fundamental goodness in the U.S. economy, right? We look at Is it still there? Constant, we saw the revision down in uh, Q1 GDP from 1.6 to 1.3. 
and um, David was talking about one of the now casts also being down there in the doldrums, one point something. On the other hand, the World Bank yesterday raised its uh, estimate for U.S. growth from 1.6 to 2.5%. So, I mean, look, Canada, maybe sitting in Canada, it's harder to be as optimistic. <laughs> um, but look, we have much better productivity. Canada doesn't have that productivity story. We have really strong productivity. And if you look at, at for, uh, gross domestic income, we're running at about 2.5, 2.8%, right? That is perfectly reasonable. If you think potential GDP is 1.8, Running at 2.2, 2.4 is running above potential. First quarter was an anomaly because of inventories, right? And let's not forget trade, which has been a drag and will still be a drag, is unlikely to be as much of a drag because you're now having a positive tailwind from the global economy, right? That okay. we haven't seen for four years. Okay, but therein lies the conundrum for Jay Powell, right? If economic growth is still strong, if the labor market is still tight, as the non-farm payrolls, uh, number seemed to bear out last uh, month. How can he cut rates without goosing inflation back up to an unacceptable, it's already at an unacceptable level, uh, though coming down, it would turn around and go back up. Okay, I, I, labor market is not collapsing, but let's not forget, we're seeing little ticks up in the unemployment rate. Right. And yes, we saw a pretty strong headline print on the on the establishment survey. But if you look at the household survey, there's persistent weakness there. You look at some of the other labor market data, the labor market is coming into better balance. And historically, you're right. The Fed has not moved until they see weakness in the labor market. Um, but we also are in such a unique cycle where inflation spiked, inflation's now on its way back down. And don't forget, the Fed can start cutting. And if they cut every other meeting, we are still gonna have restrictive policy. Even if you believe Fed funds is at three and a half percent, right? We have many more cuts to get to three and a half percent. And by the way, that is an elevated R star level, right? So most of the, most of the participants are saying R star is closer to two six. Right. So so we the Fed has plenty of policy space to begin cutting and still be restrictive and still take some bite out of demand while not hurting the parts of the economy that are going to be really helpful, like CapEx that helps improve productivity. That's the part they don't want to kill. Right. And it's really important they don't kill that part because that's going to mean we're going to be able to run at a higher growth rate with lower inflation. They want to be able to have policy rates at a level where companies are still investing in in productivity enhancing investments so all right for dummies like me who like look at the dot plot um what do we expect what should we expect today because most economists that i've been you know i being with are saying maybe they'll show two but i don't believe they can do more than one or maybe they'll show one but i don't believe they'll be able to uh do it at all what yeah do you think? so we're thinking two and we've been at two cuts for a while now we think their first one is going to be in september depending upon how the data play out probably the second one in december and uh and and we think that that's still very plausible still very reasonable especially with today's data all right, Constance, thank you so much for thank coming you. over here from radio. We need to get you back on uh, as soon as possible. Constance Hunter there. She is senior advisor at Macro Policy Perspectives. Let's get some of the price action, some of the sector price action that we're looking at this morning. I'm guessing, you know, they're all up. Let's go over to Abigail Doolittle right now. They're almost all up, Matt, but it's we have so much going on here, it's hard to know where to start. So let's start with the S&P 500's greater than 1% gain, now being led by technology, up 2.4%. This has to do with Apple absolutely breaking out of a range, a range that looked like it was going to break to the downside. It could still be a false initial reaction, but right now the bulls are really trying to take Apple higher and succeeding. The second best sector, real estate, up 2.2% uh, at its highs. It had been on pace for the best day of the year, having to do with yields plunging. Now, with yields plunging, it's interesting because utilities down about eight tenths of one percent. That sector should actually be doing better. Those dividends should be looking a little bit better, but it seems like the AI attention is going to tech on both Apple and Oracle. If we dig into the real estate sector, we are going to see big, big gains, Matt. And I talked to sources, developers uh, many times each week talking about the sensitivity to rates recently. One home building company telling me they tracked that 10-year yield uh, basically every five minutes. Well, today they're probably pretty happy, up four 
4.9% for that sector, the best day of the year. And then take a look at office, that beaten down sector up 6.2% on the hope that maybe rates are going to come in and make those cap rates look more attractive, values look a little bit more attractive, a little bit of hope at least today. More people going out there to try and catch a falling knife. By the way, Abigail, when I look at the breakdown of the industry groups on the S&P, um, and if we want to pull that up again, we'll see um, the losers that you just showed are healthcare, consumer staples, and utilities. Those are very defensive sectors. You're so is that correct. bullish? Yes, that's a great point. I'm glad that you're pointing that out. I said there's so much it's uh, going on, it's hard to know where to uh, look, but you're exactly right. The fact that those three sectors, utilities, staples, and healthcare, are down, well, that's actually bullish. Abigail, thanks very much, Abigail Doolittle there. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the Trading Diary. What you need to be watching, obviously, the Fed rate decision is it today, due out at 2 p.m. Broadcom reports results after the closing bell. Look at that. Tomorrow, we get earnings from Adobe, and on Friday, we get the BOJ decision, possibly more important for Americans, the University of Michigan consumer sentiment data. This was the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.